Gracious Heavenly Father, I just praise and, and thank you for all that you are and all that you've done. I ask your continued blessings upon this study. I ask that you'd filter out all of the ignorance, all of the foolishness, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in, in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're going to continue on in our study in 2 Thessalonians. We're in chapter 2. And I'm going to try to cover verses 1 through 7. We cannot separate biblical doctrine from biblical prophecy. Eschatology. It is impossible to separate doctrine from eschatology. To talk about one is to almost talk about the other. And we can't separate our present context, what we're about to be to look at here, from current events, I don't believe. Uh, I've often cautioned myself against reading anything into the text. But I believe that we are to interpret Scripture literally but we're also to interpret it in light of our present context. The Thessalonian church, was uh, this letter was, was given to them uh, nearly 2,000 years ago, but it's, but it's absolutely applicable, relevant to our lives today. In the last verse of chapter 1, verse 12, we looked at glorification, how that Christ is glorified, him in us, we in Him, according to grace. And there, are, there, were, there were no chapter divisions in the original text. So we're being carried over from the last verse of chapter 1, which talks about our being glorified in Him and Him in us, that according to grace, into the second chapter that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in Him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And now we come to verse 1 of chapter 2. And if you hang with me here through this video, you may come to understand some things uh, that are just a, a little bit different than maybe what you, you formerly understood to be true concerning the, the tribulation period, the nature, the character of the Antichrist, and uh, possibly even the nature or the, or the character of the, very, of the church itself, we, the body of Christ. I'm going to ask you to follow along. I'm, I'm going through the, with using the King James Version. Uh, I may not, you may or you may not see any of this on the screen. But if you'll open your Bible to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him. Coming. Now, it's interesting, and I, and I know that this uh, may sound a little bit odd, but the word coming there, uh, which we've all taken just to mean what it means, coming, Actually, the word means presence. If you look at Young's literal translation, as well as the, the real definition of the word in the, in the original text, it's presence. Now, I'm not going to uh, even offer any suggestion as to what that means. We beseech you, brethren, by the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, except to other than just to take it literally for what it says and by our gathering unto Him. So there's two things going on there. And I want you to take note that it is brothers, brethren, we beseech you, brethren. Are you, are you my brother in Christ? That, that is all-inclusive. We need to, to mark that, note that right from the very beginning. Paul is speaking to the body of Christ. He doesn't say, now we beseech you, I beseech you, some of you brethren it's all inclusive by the presence of our lord jesus christ or the coming if you want to take it that way and by our gathering together unto him that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us 
is that the day of Christ is at hand. I've, I've, meant, I've talked a lot in the past about how that the day of Christ is not the rapture. Paul is not saying that the rapture is at hand. The, the phrase day of Christ, it literally in the Greek, it's day of the Lord. And that phrase, if you, if, you, if you really take time to look at it, denotes a specific period known as what we refer to as the tribulation period. The time of Jacob's trouble. Daniel's 70th week. Not shaken. Now, not shaken denotes firmness, a standing and rest in peace. The opposite of being shaken is to be at rest. Not troubled, not alarmed, not frightened. The word troubled there means to be afraid, to be scared. Neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter. There's three things there, folks. Three things. If you look at spirit, word, and letter, to me, what that, that is speaking of is feelings, how we feel, what is spoken, or what is written. I mean, that's pretty, uh, pretty much all-inclusive. As if by us, okay, he says, assuming what we... we we feel, hear, and read to be the truth that the day of the Lord is at hand. You can't help but see the importance of truth there, folks, in verse 2. That you be not soon shaken in mind, not tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. That you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, afraid, neither by spirit, any spirit, whether it's yours or someone else's, nor by word, not, not what's spoken by, by someone, nor by letter as from us, that that, that day, that day of, of the Lord is at hand, that they are in it. That the, the Thessalonians thought that they were in the tribulation period. And I don't think many Christians have really thought this through and, and came to realize that the only way that they would have thought that they had missed the rapture is if they believed in a pre-trib rapture, folks. Verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. The, the original text literally says, no one should deceive you. There's, it's, there's a, I understand the King James and many of, many of us are really treasure that translation. Let no man deceive you is what the King James says. The original Greek says that no one should deceive you. That's what it says. In not one single way, not in any way. Why? Why? Because truth was given to them. They were not looking for the apostasy or the revealing of the Antichrist. And I've, I've mentioned in, in, in I think in, in several past videos, if you really connect the dots here, folks, this, it infers a gap. There has to be a gap between the rapture of the church and the beginning of Daniel's 70th week. We're in heaven. We're in heaven sometime before the first seal is even open. The two witnesses are said to appear before the day of the Lord. You, you can't look at that as the two witnesses are to appear before the rapture. That's not what it the Bible says, it says that they are to appear before the day of the Lord. The events in heaven before the first seal is open infers a gap. There's a, and there is a falling away from the faith. Now I believe that we are living, and I've said this before, I believe that we're living in an age of apostasy. A falling away from the faith. But that apostasy is not the apostasy. 
articulated. Okay, there is, there is the apostasy that will occur once the church is gone. The, where the, that faith is no longer present. That shall have been revealed. The, the, uh, that except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed. That's a passive. He doesn't reveal himself. It shall have been revealed is what the text is saying. In other words, there's an outside agent working on Satan. He, Satan is not revealing himself. Okay? But I believe it's God that reveals the identity of the Antichrist. He's referred to as the man of lawlessness in the text. I want you to consider even now the lawlessness that, that is occurring. Matthew 24 speaks of the second coming of Christ in which there will be an increase in lawlessness. We're seeing that right now. He's referred to as the man of lawlessness. A total disregard. What the word means basically is a total, complete disregard for God's law or His written and living word. That's what the word means. The, the very first occurrence that we see of lawlessness is in Matthew chapter 7, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity, lawlessness, same word. It's uh, the man of sin, the son of perdition. Well, I find it interesting that the Holy Spirit, couldn't He have just said the Antichrist? Why did, he says, the man of sin, the son of perdition. That's two things, folks. Two things. And I think that we, we tend to breeze over that too quickly and we just go, oh, well, that's just the Antichrist and we, that's, and, and we stop. That's it. And we don't give much thought to those two phrases. Son of. Okay? The text says that He's referred to as the son of perdition. The man of sin and the son of perdition. The, the son of perdition. The word is destruction. That is his own destruction. It's not talking about that he's, he's the destroyer even though he, he does destroy. The word implies that he is the son of his own destruction. That he will be destroyed is, is what I'm trying to say. Son of. Why does it say son of? Because it's the anti I think that the thought that the Holy Spirit is trying to convey to us here is that by using the phrase son of perdition, it is in direct contrast. It is the antithesis of the Son of God, which is life, eternal life, not destruction. The opposite. Exactly the opposite. Eternal life exists only in the Son of God. And eternal destruction lies in that man of sin, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself. And there's where it really got, the text got interesting for me. Folks, the reason I find that phrase so interesting in describing the character or the nature or the spirit of the Antichrist is that we know from Paul's teachings and much of it that we daily in our lives are confronted with the travesty of the same spirit, the same thing, self. That which opposes God and exalts self. That's what I find interesting about it. That is what error does, folks. It elevates, it exalts man. The world system, the world religious system based on human merit. It opposes God, the authority of His Word, the truth of God's Word. And in, in, in its place, it go, it, it, you live by, you walk by feelings, not by faith. 
we know that we are to walk by faith, not by sight, not by feelings, okay? Feelings, which is what Paul is trying to tell the Thessalonians that they are, they are not to allow any, even the, their own selves, the, to be their own spirit, to be deceived or, or any written word or spoken word or anything else to deceive them into believing that they are living within, within a period of time in which, which contradicts the very nature of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ in their place and what Christ accomplished that there was no condemnation, that they would be, that they they did not belong to that period of trial and tribulation. Sure, they were suffering, but they were not destined for that wrath, and yet they were afraid that they were in that period. And it amazes me even to this day, folks, how that Christians, by the score can believe not only that the, the church must go through Daniel's 70th week, but that the rapture, if in fact they even believe there is a rapture, they believe that it's based on merit. Or that somehow the body of Christ is dismembered and only the good Christians are raptured and the rest go through the tribulation. And they go through the tribulation as what? As members of, body, of Christ's body. Or maybe if or if they're not saved, well, I guess then they were never members of Christ's body, which makes them tribulation saints. Anyone, they are correct in if, in saying, and if if what they were are suggesting is is that uh, there will be some religious people left behind. Well, it is true that the only ones that are left behind were never members of Christ's body to begin with. They become tribulation saints or they do not they're either saved during that period delivered during that period or they are not this this antichrist opposes and exalts himself self we know that we've died to self we know that it is it is not i paul says it's not i that lives but christ that lives in me self 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 everything is self Self-will, self, self-determination, uh, self, you know, it being autonomous. God's not sovereign, self is. Self-will, self-righteousness, self, 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 self. And what, what we see in this text is that the Antichrist, an Antichrist opposes and exalts himself. That's what I want you to see. And I think that it's important to take note of that because that same spirit of, of Antichrist, Paul says, is now presently at work. Why a need for a man of sin? Well, I mean, you know, couldn't... Uh, in other words, there's a spirit of, of the Antichrist and, and there's self and that, that which opposes God and exalts self. And you know, Why do we even need uh, a, such a person as the Antichrist to begin with? Why, why do we need that? Why did God uh, determine in His overall plan of redemption for there to be a man of lawlessness, a, a literal, single individual known as the Antichrist? I believe it was, to, it was to solidify or to identify the period known as the tribulation period. We, we can know that we're not in the tribulation because He is not here. He has not been revealed. All that is called God or that is worshipped. You know, our text will, will go on to, to show us that, that He opposes, He rejects all that's, that's called God or that's worshipped. Now, many of you know that, that for the longest time that I have had my ideas, my views concerning the identity of the Antichrist, and, and if you've watched this channel for any time at all, you probably know in what direction I lean as it regards the identity of the Antichrist and where he comes out of, what he's associated with, uh, in that, including a religion, and what our text says. The Antichrist will literally 
forsake all or oppose he will oppose all note the word all highlight the word all there in the text all that is called god or that is worship that includes that has to include every religion every single religion all means all and he forsakes the gods plural of his fathers daniel 11:37 don't be misled by the, the translations that say that, well, he's got to be a Jew because he forsakes the God of his father's singular. The Hebrew word is plural. Okay? It's plural. He forsakes the gods, plural, of his fathers. That can only be pagan gods. The, Antichrist, the text makes it absolutely crystal clear that the Antichrist is not a Jew, but a Gentile. Daniel 11. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god. He will show no regard for the gods of his father. Of his fathers. That's what the text says. You know, it's been a, a widely held belief down through the history of the church that, that you know, that the Antichrist has, well, he's got to be of a Jewish uh, uh, origin. And, it, and that view is still popular even today. Yet the truth is that you will find no real scriptural basis for, for such a view as that. In fact, the Bible teaches just the opposite, that the Antichrist will be of Gentile descent. You know, during med medieval times, there was a uh, almost it was almost universally held that the Antichrist had to be a Jew. And during the late medieval period, we, we, there's a shift. We see a shift from a personal Antichrist to a corporate one, as some Catholics and reformers, you know, they they tended to well, they looked at the popes, the successive popes. And, and the Roman church, you know, as the Antichrist, and I, I, I even st still see that, that, that junk on YouTube even today. <coughs> but the early medieval church, <coughs> it always saw an individual Antichrist. And for the last couple of hundred years, with the revival of the literal interpretation of prophecy, that, that idea that the Antichrist was the, well, it was the, the system of the Roman uh, Catholic Church, it's, it's, it's become less and less popular. So despite what you might hear thrown out today as, as solid evidence, solid proof, you know, especially on YouTube, uh, that the Pope was, uh, uh, is the Antichrist, you know, that's basically, by most major scholars, that's basically been forgotten or outright rejected. Even fundamental evangelical Christians such as myself have, been, have, have really been, and most of the major prominent leaders of fundamental evangelical Christianity, uh, they've been uncomfortable with that whole idea that the Antichrist is somehow, he comes out of the Roman Catholic system or he comes out of the Vatican. You know, he's the, the Pope is the Antichrist and all that nonsense. And some of the earliest writers on the Antichrist, they thought that the Antichrist would likely be of the tribe of Dan. You may have heard that. And that was reinforced throughout the Middle Ages. And many of our own prominent dispensational prophecy teachers today, they point out that uh, there is no direct, no express declaration of Scripture which says in so many words that the Antichrist will be a Jew. Okay? Yet they'll say that the hints given are so plain, so obvious that we're that we just we're forced to believe that he must be a Jew. In other words, they admit that their view lacks direct biblical support, and that's not good. You know, anytime you begin on that basis, you're not gonna 
you know, that doesn't go very far as, with me as far as credibility is concerned. So it's argued that, uh, that he'll be a Jew since the Jews are responsible. Well, they're, they're, they're the, resp the, the ones that are to be blamed for all the world's problems. So, you know, he's got to be a Jew. That's, anti, that's the anti-Semitic uh, reason. And, and even though, you know, you'd have to be blind not to see that the world is anti-Semitic to a great extent, that is not sufficient reason to conclude that the Antichrist must be of Jewish descent. There's another argument that says that, he's, well, he's got to be a Jew since the Jews would only accept a Jew as their Messiah. You know, certainly no religious Jew would, would dream of, of accepting a Gentile as the Messiah of Israel. That's, that's what they say. And that's, that view is built upon the logic that since the Antichrist is just that, an anti-Messiah, well, then his career must be a counterfeit of Jesus' you know, first coming. Now, while some of that is true, that can be carried too far. The, the specific descriptions of the Antichrist are more like that of a political leader. And just the mere term Antichrist appears in the minds of many people to be justification for thinking that, that since Jesus was a Jew, well, you know, then so must be the Antichrist. So, you know, the argument kind of goes like, well, the Jews will accept the Antichrist as the Messiah. The Jews will never accept a Gentile as the Messiah. Uh, so therefore, the Antichrist must be a Jew. Now, there's a lot of problems with that argument, uh, the least of which are, are, I mean, well, first of all, neither uh, premise can be supported from the Bible. Just because the unbelieving Jews enter into a covenant of death and hell with the Antichrist does not mean that they accept him as their Messiah. It doesn't follow from these texts uh, or any others that I know of, that Israel accepts him as Messiah or Antichrist. I know that's, that may be a popular belief, but that is not what, you, what this book says, folks. And since they're not accepting him as Messiah, the fact that he is a Gentile peacemaker is irrelevant. So both premises are faulty. And So their conclusion is faulty. Anytime you start out with a faulty premise, you're going to wind up with a faulty conclusion. So the argument kind of goes, well, the, the tribe from which the Antichrist would come, wouldn't, well, it wouldn't be listed among the 144,000. Dan is not among the 144,000. So therefore, the Antichrist is from the tribe of Dan. That, it's just a, a faulty reasoning, a faulty conclusion. The problem with that is that it's an argument from silence. Only God knows why Dan was left out. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be just as important to note that the, the tribe of Dan will be included in millennial Israel? We, see, we read that in Ezekiel. The entire argument is based upon circular reasoning. The major premise contains a Jewish assumption as a starting point point. So, you know, it's, it's surprising that this line of reasoning concludes that the Antichrist is of Jewish descent. Or maybe not so surprising. Since, well, that's, that's really what circular reasoning is all about, so it shouldn't be surprising. But that's, folks, I, I practically stake my life on the fact that the Antichrist will be a Gentile, not a Jew. Now, why is that important? And why am I going all around the mountain to try to stress that point, to push that point? Well, maybe by the time we get to the end of this video, you'll understand my reason. He is God. He sits in the temple of God, showing himself to be God. Have you ever stopped, folks, to realize that today Christ is the temple? 
and we are members of that one body, the temple. We're not a bunch of little temples running around, okay, as like most Christians think. Most Christians I know think that we, they are, their body is a, is a temple. Well, my body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. No, you are a member of the one singular body, the body of Christ. You're a member of it. We are not individual temples running around. So the Antichrist sits in the temple of God, showing himself to be God. Today, Christ is the temple, and we are members of that one body, the temple. All right? And I want to ask you, what, what, what about the blasphemy of our claiming to be God in our lives that mirrors the image of the Antichrist, where we oppose everything that that is of God, including the written word and the living word, and we exalt self. Remember ye not, Paul says, verse 5, that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. Folks, they had to be pre-trib. Verse 6, and now ye know, ye know, that's the word know is perfect knowledge. Oida in the Greek, it's perfect knowledge. It's not experiential knowledge. It is perfect knowledge. They perfectly know what withholdeth that he, the Antichrist, the son of perdition, the man of lawlessness, might be revealed in his time. How did they know? Well, they knew because they were told. They knew because they had God's Word. They had received the, the revelation from God. But they knew what withholdeth. Well, what is that referring to? The Gospel. The reason I, I'm suggesting it refers to the Gospel is because when you look at that in the Greek, it is neuter. Okay? Neuter. Down in verse 7, for the, the mystery of iniquity, iniquity doth already work only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way okay he only he who now letteth will let until he who is that speaking of the holy spirit why do i say that because it's masculine okay masculine back up to verse six and now ye know what withholdeth neuter okay the gospel, that he might be revealed in his time. What is withholding the gospel? That's what I'm trying to suggest here. I believe that we can honestly derive that from the text. It revealed in his time. Well, that's an interesting, you know, in his time. Chronos chronological time in in God's appointed time you, you can write that in for a definite fact it's God's appointed time not his not the Antichrist time not Satan's time God's appointed time for the mystery of iniquity doth already work it already works and uh, opposing God and exalting self yes it does it is already at work it has been folks it's been at work since the beginning of the church at Pentecost since the first legalizers crept in. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. He being the Holy Spirit is what I'm, I'm suggesting here. The Holy Spirit is taken out of the way. There is a transition from the gospel of the kingdom to the Holy Spirit's ministry during that period. The Holy Spirit is not taking, taken out of the way in the sense that, well, the Holy Spirit is, is, is no longer going to be active during the tribulation period. He's active only in a different way. It can only mean that the Holy Spirit is removed because the body of Christ is removed because the body of Christ is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. So, what do these first seven verses, what are they really saying to us? What does verses 1 through 7 reveal? 
We can derive an awful lot from this text, folks. But the believers at Thessalonica, they thought because of the suffering that they were enduring, that they were witnessing, that they were experiencing, they thought that the, the day of the Lord, the, the time of Jacob's trouble, Daniel's 70th week, had arrived when they had already been given revelation from God that He would return, Christ would return for the church prior to what is known as that period. Now, it, confirming their having been given the truth concerning a pre-trib rapture, that it, they could not have been shaken thinking they had left behind if they did not believe that there was a, a pre-trib rapture, folks. <coughs> I've, I've made videos on how important that that really is. You know, well, and I've heard this argument before, uh, you know, and I, and I still experience the same reality of it today. Well, you're pre-trib, I'm mid-trib. This guy, he's post-trib. This guy, he's no-trib. This guy's no rapture. This, this person here, they're partial rapture. That means some Christians depart and some d are left behind. The, the good ones God takes and the, the bad ones are left behind to go through the truth. And I've heard it all. Ha has, how many Christians have really stopped to think that just what that does to the very nature of the church itself, the definition of the church? More specifically, what that whole argument does to the very finished work of Christ on our behalf. What makes pre-trib our blessed hope so important is simply to not be pre-trib. We fail to realize, to apprehend, to comprehend in, in all of its glorious fullness just what Christ did on behalf of us, His body, the church. You cannot, if you are not pre-trib, then you, you are lacking in your understanding of what Christ did for you. We've seen that this is speaking to the brethren. Every believer in Christ, the brethren, folks, that's what the text says. The rapture is not based on merit. And that rather being afraid, they could rest and trust God. And because this revelation came from God Himself through Paul, stressing the importance of standing firm in God's Word as opposed to being deceived by any means or in any way, that we see that we're looking for His return for His body, the church, not events that will unfold after the church has been removed. That the Antichrist does not reveal himself, but he's revealed by God. That he's referred to as the man of lawlessness, meaning a disregard for God's written and living Word. And that he's also referred to as the son of destruction, that is, his own destruction. Okay? The Holy Spirit could have said, just, just, just said Antichrist, but, but the, the inference here is, I believe, a contrast between the Son of Destruction and the Blessed Son of God. One denotes condemnation, the other eternal life. And that He opposes and exalts Himself. When we know that our walk here below is itself hindered by the travesty of self, you know, the error which elevates and exalts man. You know, that denigrates God, that pushes God down and raises man up. Where man is sovereign, not God. You know, it, it, which practically defines the present world religious system based on human merit. I believe that we can drive from just these few verses that there is a need in God's plan of the ages for not just the spirit of Antichrist, which even now works, but a man of sin, a literal man of sin, without which the world would have no way to even identify the period known as the tribulation period. Because that man opposes 
everything that is true of God. He, he basically represents a fallen humanity's uh, effort to try to, to live his life without God. We see that he opposes all that is called God or, or that is worshipped. All, okay? Including, therefore, that must include his own religion. And I believe I gave sufficient evidence that the Antichrist will not be a, a Jew but a Gentile. You've got to look at that. You, make, you have to decide on your own for, for yourselves, folks. For he forsakes the gods, plural, of his fathers. That he sits in the temple showing himself to be God. And I suggest to you without apology that when individual members of the one temple, the body of Christ, push down God and elevate self above the sovereign God with self-will, self-determination, self-righteousness, they are in fact mirroring the very characteristics of the man of sin himself. The very spirit of the Antichrist, which amounts to, to exercising a total disregard for God's Word. God used Paul to remind these believers of these things. Not, not just truth pertaining to eschatology, but doctrine, because the two cannot be separated from one another. To speak of one, we, we must speak of the other. Paul made it clear that they knew perfectly what was withholding the gospel that the Antichrist might be revealed in God's time. Because when the church is removed, the two witnesses will pro proclaim not the gospel of Christ to the church, not the gospel that we proclaim, but the gospel of the kingdom. It's a replay of John the Baptist, folks. The gospel of the kingdom to a world that, it, that can expect to see the visible return of Christ and that the tribulation period would not occur until the Holy Spirit, the restrainer of that period, was removed. And we know that the Holy Spirit lives in us, His body, the church. Folks, we are not looking for any of that. We are looking and ex for and expecting the rapture of the church, the blessed hope, the return of our Lord Jesus Christ for us. I love you all. I truly do. I ask for your continued prayers for this ministry and for those out there who are hurting and suffering, going through various circumstances and trials, trying to, to trust God in those trials. If you're one of those, be assured that I am constantly praying for you i thank you for all of your kind messages of what you, that you leave me on youtube those encouraging words of kindness and love and support i thank you for all of for those who are supporting this ministry i thank you from the bottom of my heart until next time this is steve thanks for watching